Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Adolescent Family Life Program, or AFLP, Request for Application, or RFA, informational webinar hosted by the California Department of Public Health, Paternal, Child, and Adolescent Health Division. I'm Calandra Park, Chief of the Adolescent Family Life Program Unit, and I am joined by my team, Sangi Kabadi and Claire Sang and Vicki Grenz, the AFLP Program Consultants, and we will be your presenters for this webinar. Next slide. Before we dive into the webinar, I just wanted to draw your attention to a few things. Everything that is discussed in this webinar can also be found on the AFLP RFA webpage, which you'll see is hyperlinked on the slide. It's also important to note that the written RFA document and any addenda take precedence over anything shared during this webinar. And finally, You'll see this light bulb icon on some slides to highlight important information that applica applicants should be aware of when reviewing the RFA. Next slide, please. As with any RFA process, we anticipate that there will be questions after viewing this webinar and or reviewing the RFA. So please be mindful of the following. Because this is a competitive process, we are unable to provide advice, opinions, or personalized answers. We ask that you submit all questions related to this procurement by email only to aflp underscore rfa at cdph.ca.gov by March 8th at 4 p.m. Please follow the instructions found in the RFA and all responses will be posted on the AFLP RFA webpage on March 21st. If there are any updates to the RFA, they will also be posted on the webpage. So consider bookmarking this site and checking it regularly for updates. Next slide, please. So thank you again for taking time to watch the AFLP RFA informational webinar. We are going to provide an overview of the RFA as outlined here on this agenda slide. And we'll now go over each item in further detail. Next slide, please. But before we do that, however, we wanted to share the key action dates at both the beginning and at the end of this presentation, as we know these are important to note. So all applicants are advised of the schedule and must adhere to the required dates and times. Please note that CDPH MCH um, reserves the right to adjust any date and or time as necessary. And any of these adjustments will be posted as an addendum on the AFLP RFA website. It is the applicant's responsibility to check the AFLP RFA website frequently, as we mentioned on the previous slide, for any adjustments made to the timeline and the RFA in general. Next slide. Next slide, please. So we'll begin this RFA presentation by first providing an overview of the program model that AFLP is based on to lay the foundation, which is the Positive Youth Development, or PYD, as it's known, um, model. Next slide, please. The purpose of the PYD model is to improve the life course trajectory of expectant and parenting youth through resiliency-based youth-led case management. Also integrated into that is life planning to help individuals make plans based on their priorities, values and resources and develop personal goals related to their health and other cir current circumstances. So using this model, AFLP aims to specifically improve the life course trajectory of expectant and parenting youth and their children by increasing educational attainment, improving pregnancy planning and spacing, increasing access to and utilization of needed services, and in increasing social and emotional support. When youth achieve success in the program, it increases their confidence and ability to set and achieve their goals, address challenges, and celebrate achievements beyond their time in the program. We'll discuss this in greater detail in just a bit. Next slide, please. So what exactly is the AFLP PYD model? The PYD model provides an individualized approach to enhance expectant and parenting youth strengths, skills, and motivation to reach their goals. Throughout implementation, case managers are assisting youth in accessing information, resources, and referrals to improve health, health outcomes for the youth and their child um, children. Using motivational interviewing, or MI, 
strategies, supportive case managers will help expect, expectant and parenting youth meet their basic needs, develop their strengths, foster hope for the future, identify opportunities and social support networks, learn about caring for themselves and their families. The PYD model can be delivered through two different methods. Visits can be in person or face-to-face -face between the youth and their case manager, as well as virtual visits via video or phone. This hybrid approach still requires that visits occur approximately twice a month. And these visits should occur in a supportive, confidential and safe environment mutually agreed upon by both the case manager and the youth. Some examples are the youth's home, school, a community center, an agency office, the park or a virtual platform. Home visits also provide a great opportunity for case managers to assess the home environment itself, as well as supporting the youth with establishing a safe and healthy living space for themselves and their children. In addition, case managers can also involve the youth's family and other key people um, in that youth's life uh, in the process with their consent and direction. Next slide, please. So research on the PYD approach has found that its emphasis on the many positive attributes of young people and focus on, focus on working to develop inherent strengths and assets in youth help promote healthy behavioral development. What is implicit in this approach and the resilience framework is the notion that all youth have the potential to thrive, benefit from high expectations and supportive relationships and are capable of making meaningful contributions to their lives, families, and communities. In other words, they will rise to the occasion. The principles listed on this slide were adapted from the work of the California Adolescent Sexual Health Work Group, which is an active group of public and private stakeholders committed to addressing the sexual and reproductive health of California adolescents. Next slide. As mentioned previously, building resilience is a key component of the PYD model. Research shows that the following factors help young people adapt and thrive even when facing adversity, caring relationships and high expectations, opportunities for meaningful contributions and participation. They wanna be a part of the solution. Ability to handle emotions and respond proactively, sense of purpose and bright future, hence the goal setting in AFLP, positive identity, self-awareness and self-efficacy, problem solving skills, planning, flexibility, resourcefulness. This is something that case managers support youth with throughout the program. Social competence, communication, connections, healthy relationships. The image on the slide is of an AFLP participant meeting with her case manager. Next slide. In the next few slides, we will walk through key requirements for each of the four phases of PYD. We'll start with the key activities that are addressed in every program visit, which are referrals, skills building, life planning, and goal setting, and a check-in about the four program priorities, which are education and work, healthy relationships, family planning and safer sex, health and healthcare. So during each visit, case managers are checking in with the youth about these program priorities to identify any needs, as well as assess their their progress in meeting these goals. Next slide. The AFLP model is organized into four program phases that cover at minimum a 12 month period. Individual phases may take longer depending on the needs of the program participant. The model builds in flexibility for youth to remain in the program for up to 24 months based on the case manager and youth's assessments of need, engagement, and the youth's readiness to exit the program. Many of the activities in later phases build on content covered in earlier phases. So a youth's strengths, support networks, goals and dreams, and values are all identified early in the program, which assists with the subsequent intentional life planning discussions. The life planning and goal setting process becomes progressively more advanced from phase one to phase four, eventually transitioning to independent life planning with self-directed goal setting. Next slide. So let's take a closer look at the first phase. Phase one is a minimum of four visits with the youth. And the purpose is to 
engage youth in the program, build a foundation of support, and begin to strengthen and, and apply resilience strengths. Phase one is about the initial assessment, engagement, and plan development. And ideally, there are four required visits over two months with optional life planning visits based on youth's needs. For example, if the youth is facing multiple, multiple stressors or major life challenges and needs additional support, the case manager can be responsive by meeting with the youth if the youth wants making, and making sure that it's youth led. This is an example of the flexibility that is built into the program. Phase one is also a great time to just get to know the youth, their needs, strengths, and priorities, as well as orient them to the program. Throughout this phase, case managers will work mostly on the My Life and on the My Life and Me booklet, as well as the comprehensive baseline assessment, or CBA as it's known with the youth. Next slide. The next phase, phase two, is a minimum of eight visits, which is the most of any phase and focuses on fostering strengths and sense of purpose. So during this phase, the youth identifies and builds an understanding of self. In other words, their strengths, values, dreams, hopes, and relationships. Case managers continue activities from the My Life and Me booklet and continue to support the youth with goal setting and life planning. This is also when the My Life plan booklet is introduced and at least one essential section is completed in this phase. So phase two is when much of the substantial work with the youth is done. The case manager continues to build trust with the youth by working to develop their protective factors, engages youth in activities and discussions focusing on further reflection of strengths, relationships, dreams, values, and hopes for the future, and refers and connects them to resources and opportunities that will help them pursue their goals and meet basic needs. Next slide. Phase three of the PYD model is a minimum of six visits and focuses on empowerment and implementation of life planning and goal pursuit. Case managers continue to facilitate the advanced goal setting process and empower youth to take action and pursue their goals. They also continue to support the youth in identifying, building, and applying strengths and skills. There is a focus on program priorities by implementing life planning activities related to the four program priorities, which are education and work, health, family planning, and safer sex, healthy relationships, and parenting. The remaining three essential sections of the My Life Plan booklet are then completed. Between phases three and four, the case manager then assesses and discusses with the youth their readiness to transition out of the program. And if the youth is ready, they move on to phase four. Next slide. This last phase, phase four, is a minimum of three visits and up to six with the youth and focuses on, as mentioned, transition and program exit. Together, the case manager and youth make plans for a purposeful transition out of AFLP. But now the youth will do independent goal setting using the My Goal Sheet and Life Planning handout. The case manager will also reassess the youth's needs and progress on goals at the end of phase three. And if the youth is not ready to exit the program or their needs change, the youth and case manager can consider returning to phase three. Otherwise, the case manager assists the youth in solidifying plans for linkage and supports related to the four program priorities that will pers persist beyond AFLP and eventually transitions the youth out of the program. So this concludes the overview of the PYD model itself, and I will now pass it off to Sangi, who will share information on related sources and requirements. Thank you. Next slide, please. The PYD model is supported by standardized, evidence-informed case management tools and processes designed to intentionally support and build resilience, promote life planning, and support the program priorities of education and employment, healthy relationships, health and health care, family planning, and safer sex. These tools are also available in English and Spanish. The PYD model in its entirety would be made available to final awardees prior to program implementation. The images shown are of a youth and their case manager hugging and snapshots of MCH tools, including a sample tool completed by a youth. It reads, at first I thought I had no strength, 
but after completing the activities, I now know that I actually do have strengths. I feel like now that I know my strengths, I think I will try and use them more and try to use the ones that I wish I had. I think the strengths that I have are important in my life because I want to be a good example to my daughter and now I can kind of help her know her own strengths as she grows. Next slide, please. Applicants are strongly advised to review the PYD model resources available in Appendix 1A through 1D. These include the theoretical foundation of the PYD model, PYD model guiding principles, implementing PYD with fidelity, and the PYD logic model. Please note that the material provided may be updated prior to awardee training and implementation. Next slide, please. AFLP requires the following requirements. Complete required training and professional development, comply with the California Sexual Health Education Accountability Act, adequately staff to meet program requirements, establish and maintain collaborative referral networks, contribute to required monitoring, evaluation, and quality improvement activities, and comply with administrative, programmatic, and data-related requirements. The RFA and scope of work reflect the MCH priorities and AFLP requirements. Next slide, please. As an applicant, it is your responsibility to carefully review both the RFA and scope of work where you will find more information about MCH priorities and AFLP program requirements, including performance expectations. Here are some examples. Intra-programming is culturally and linguistically affirming, youth-centered, developmentally appropriate. Maintain an active caseload of a minimum of 25 youth for every one full-time equivalent case manager. To be clear, an active case is defined as a participant with an open AFLP service file who has had a valid program visit within the past 90 days. Maintain a minimum 85% active caseload and provide weekend and evening hours no less than twice a month. Failure to meet any of these expectations may result in a performance improvement plan, funding reduction, or loss of funds. Next slide, please. We'll begin with a description of the funding opportunity itself. Next slide, please. The purpose of this RFA is to solicit applications from eligible entities for funding from the California Department of Public Health, Maternal, Child, and Adolescent Health Division, CDPH MCH, through CFDA number 93.994 to administer the Adolescent Family Life Program, or AFLP, and implement evidence-informed positive youth development, or PYD model, to support expectant and parenting youth in California. Shown on the slide is an image of a youth talking with their case manager. Next slide, please. The funds administered by CDPH MCH to implement AFLP come from California's Title V Maternal and Child Health Block Grant, which is a federal program that provides funding to improve the health of mothers, fathers, children, and families. The total amount to be distributed among awardees is anticipated to be $5.6 million per state fiscal year for each of the three years within the contract period, which is July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2026. Anticipated funding per awardee per state fiscal year of the contract period based on the caseload and full-time equivalent of case management staff implementing program services is described in a subsequent slide, anticipated funding levels. The minimum funding award is $190,000. The range of case manager FTEs is one through four. Next slide, please. Shown on the slide are anticipated funding levels. 
CDPH MCH will not fund any agency for more than four full-time equivalent FTE case managers, so applicants should build their budgets accordingly. Any additional case managers and associated staff and expenses would have to be provided in kind. Once agencies have been selected through the RFA scoring process, CDPH MCH will award funds based on need and total funding availability for one to four case managers in accordance with the staffing and case load criteria. CDPH MCH reserves the right to make awards at alternate funding levels from the proposals based on an assessment of need in the target area, reach estimates, quality of the application, and other considerations related to the total program resources available. Next slide, please. CDPH MCH anticipates awarding at least one agency per region and a maximum of one award in any county, with the exception of Los Angeles County, where CDPH MCH anticipates a minimum of one to a maximum of four awards. In some cases, there may be exceptions based on the need of the county and capacity of the awardees. Next slide, please. For the next few slides, we'll take a moment to highlight the public health need for this funding. In California, the adolescent birth rate, or ABR, declined 76% between 2000 and 2019. Despite a long-term decline in the ABR in California, disparities persist on the basis of race and ethnicity, as well as location. The 2019 adolescent birth rate or ABR in California shows a 3.2 times higher rate among black youth than non-Hispanic white youth, 4.2 times higher among Hispanic and Latino youth than non-Hispanic white youth. And the county with the highest three-year aggregated ABR, which is Tulare, is 5.2 times higher than the county with the lowest rate, which is Marin. A high ABR is associated with high levels of poverty and limited economic and educational opportunities. Social determinants of health, such as high rates of poverty, limited economic and educational opportunities, systemic and institutional racism, as well as a lack of safe and nurturing environments, are significant influencers of the life, of the life course trajectories of young people, regardless of early parenthood. Next slide, please. This slide takes a closer look at PRB, which stands for percent of repeat births among adolescents. From 2000 to 2018, percentage of repeat births, or PRB, declined among young people before age 20 years. Like the ABR, inequities in PRB exist by race, ethnicity, and geography. In 2018, 66% of young people with a repeat birth experienced a suboptimal interpregnancy interval. Closely spaced births increased the risk of adverse pregnancy and birth outcomes. Young people with a live birth were more likely to experience adversities during pregnancy compared to the general birthing population. For example, intimate partner violence, depression, and housing. Next slide, please. Current messaging in the media often frames young parenthood as a social problem and a drain on public resources. The shame and social stigma associated with young parenthood may feel isolating for young parents and has been shown to contribute to depression, stress, and anxiety for them. Using strength-based and trauma-informed approaches when working with adolescent parents are effective ways to connect and support young families using positive youth development strategies that promote healing, strength, and connections to a trusted adult are associated with improving the health and well-being of young parents. Please. Therefore, within this landscape of adolescent health, AFLP is a case management program for expectant and parenting youth ages 21 and under. The goals of the program are 
to increase social and emotional support and build resiliency, empower youth to cultivate personal autonomy to make informed decisions about their sexual and reproductive health, strengthen youth knowledge and self-efficacy for education and career attainment, and increase access to and utilization of needed services. The images shown on the slide are of a, an MCH participant um, with their baby. Next slide, please. This slide provides some history about AFLP. For over 37 years, local AFLP providers have provided case management services that promote the health and well being of expectant and parenting youth in diverse settings throughout California. Over the last 12 years, Local AFLP providers have contributed to the development, implementation, and evaluation of a strengths-based, evidence-informed model for AFLP, known as the Positive Youth Development Model. Organizations awarded funding will implement the PYD model following a period of capacity building, planning, and training outlined in the scope of work, which is Exhibit A. I will now pass it over to Vicki, who will share about the RFA eligibility and application process. Thank you. Thank you. I'll cover the eligibility criteria, which are described in part two, section H of the RFA. Slide, please. The RFA outlines the eligibility criteria in part two, section H. The following entities and organizations in counties of priority need are eligible to apply for this RFA. They include units of local government, including but not limited to cities, counties, and other government bodies or special districts, state and or public colleges or universities, which are also referred to as institutions of higher education, and public and or non uh, private nonprofit organizations classified as 501c3, tax exempt under the Internal Revenue Code. Slide, please. The first type of criteria we'll cover is required experience. Applicants must have three or more years of experience in each of the following areas, providing case management or other social support services to expectant and parenting persons, referred to as EPP, who are experienced in the highest inequities, those providing youth development programming, uh, three years experience with program monitoring, including data collection and reporting of performance measures, and developing community linkages and providing in and maintaining stakeholder groups. Slide, please. All applications are required to meet the requirement of serving eligible youth. That includes those who are 21 years of age and younger and are expecting, parenting, or working on gaining or regaining custody of their child or children. Application, applications are required to maintain staffing, like the director, supervisor, and case manager positions, the coordinator and youth advisor positions are now required. While all agencies must maintain program data, a position of data entry staff is an optional position. Please note that staffing is limited to the positions listed here and that all staff must be included in the budget. Slide, please. Another eligibility criteria is the California Adolescent Sexual Health Needs Index, referred to as CASHNI. DDPH MCAH developed the CASHNI to target resources for primary and secondary adolescent pre pregnancy prevention programs to assess areas of the state facing the greatest inequities in social and health outcomes. The CASHNI formula includes each county's annual number of live births to individuals under age 19, additional community characteristics, such as percentage of youth living in concentrated areas of poverty, suboptimal pregnancy intervals, rural community status, racial inequity, educational attainment, ABR, uh, adolescent birth rate, and PBR, percent of repeat, repeat births. 
Cashney countywide scores across California range from 0 to 14,193, with higher numbers representing greater need. To target limited resources, counties with a Cashney score of 250 and above are eligible to apply. There are links to two resources uh, listed on the slide for information on the Cashney methodology and county scores, refer to Appendix 2, Population and Community Need Data. And for additional information about the Cashney, see the California Sexual Health Needs Index. Slide, please. The final eligibility criteria is projected expectant and parenting persons, referred to as EPP. California, uh, CDPH MCH developed projected numbers of EPP in the year 2023 for each county, identifying the number of young parents who are 21 years and younger that would be eligible for case management services. EPP data enables CDPH MCH to prioritize program services to areas of the state where young parents reside. It also enables CDPH MCH to align the staffing level of local programs with the number of youth available within their communities. This ensures agencies are able to maintain the required caseload of at least 25 active youth per full-time equivalent case manager. The EPP projection accounts for declines in the eligible population over time, as well as cross-eligibility with other services such as CalLearn, Department of Social Services Home Visiting Initiative, California Home Visiting Program, as well as unexplained variance in population projections. For more information, visit Appendix 2 Population and Community Need Data. Thank you. For applicants targeting one county, counties with a CASHNI score of 250 and above, and projected eligible population of at least 200 expectant and parenting persons are eligible to apply so long as the organization meets the other eligibility requirements relating to program reach and agency experience. Applications where a single or lead entity proposes to serve two or more counties will be considered if at least one of the county cash needs scores is 250 or above and the combined EPP is 300 or greater. The counties proposed must be proximal to each other geographically and the applicant must demonstrate the ability to adequately provide services across county lines. Slide please, thank you. There are 27 eligible counties as shown in part three of the RFA. Appendix two, table one covers all counties and includes the CASHNI score, projected number of expectant and parenting persons, and the eligibility status for each county. Table three has this information by medical service area. Slide please. Take a deeper dive here into eligibility criteria relating to program reach. For the purposes of this RFA, program reach is defined as the number of youth that receive any AFLP services in a given fiscal year. Though implementation will vary by agency, CDPH MCAH has estimated that the minimum reach of 50 youth per 100% full time equivalent case manager is needed in order to maintain the required caseload of 25 active AFLP youth. Each applicant must identify a program service area and develop a reasonable and well-justified expected program reach in response to this RFA. Applicants proposing to serve two or more counties may apply to meet the program reach requirement by combining reach in all counties. CDPH MCH will make final decisions based on the feasibility of the proposed implementation, justification, and available resources. Applicants will complete attachment nine 
program reach worksheet. And resources to calculate program reach are provided in Appendix 2. Slide, please. Let's take a moment to review some key metrics, uh, annual program reach and active case. Annual program reach looks at the number of youth who receive at least one program visit after their enrollment visit and had at least one valid program visit during the fiscal year. The requirement is that applicants have a minimum program reach annually of 50 youth per 100% full-time equivalent case manager in order to maintain the required caseload of 25 active cases for each full-time equivalent case manager. Active case looks at the number of youth who have an open service file and have had at least one program visit after their enrollment visit and they've had a program visit within the last 90 days. Active caseload will be assessed monthly. Awardees will be required to maintain a minimum of 85% of the required active caseload. Failure to meet the minimum active caseload will result in a performance improvement plan, funding reduction, or loss of funds. Slide, please. Here are some things to keep in mind about program reach. The proposed annual program reach should justify the proposed funding level. The staffing pattern must correspond with the annual program reach as described in Table 4 of the RFA minimum staffing pattern. As an example, that's 50 youth per 100% full-time equivalent case manager, and uh, it would be 25 youth for each 50% uh, uh, full-time equivalent case manager. Applicants proposing to serve more than one county may combine annual program reach in all proposed counties to meet the requirement. And program reach is addressed in the RFA. Other resources are Appendix 2, which contains population and community need data, and append, excuse me, Attachment 9, the program reach worksheet, which includes the form to be completed and instructions for completing the program reach worksheet form. Slide, please. The next section up is four, program narrative and corresponding attachments. Part five of the program narrative uh, of the RFA covers the program narrative and corresponding attachments. It includes general instructions for completing the application narrative using attachment three, the AFLP RFA program narrative template. Each of the five sections has been assigned scoring values. Applicants must describe agency need and organizational capacity, need in the proposed service area, the implementation plan, community engagement, referral network, and letters of support, and proposed budget. Please ensure that responses are complete, concise, follow the instructions provided in the template, and respond directly to the information requested. Slide, please. Note, all attachments that applicants must reference and complete are posted on the RFA webpage, and they must be downloaded. Attachment 1 is the application cover page. Attachment 2 is the application checklist. And excuse me, attachment 3 is the AFLP RFA program narrative template, which is a PDF fillable form that is the heart of your application. In attachments four through eight, you'll tell us more about your organization. Attachment four is the org chart, there's references, governmental contracts, audited financial statements, and finally, uh, attachment eight is litigation and contract compliance difficulties. Next slide, please. Additionally, there are uh, attachments nine through 15. 9 through 12 tell us about your proposed program, the, pro the program reach worksheet, the service area needs and strategies, and letters of support and budget template. Attachments 13 through 15 are agreements. These include the CDPH MCH agency information form, a form attesting that you'll, you will comply with the Sexual Health Accountability Act of 20, uh, 2007, 
And while listed as optional, Attachment 15 is required by agencies that intend to select Title 19 funding. Additional required content includes proof of insurance, which is required of all applicants. Additionally, there are other documents that, if applicable, are required. Depending upon your organization type, you will submit the specified documentation of your tax status. Slide, please. Next, we'll cover Section 5, which is the contract budget and justification. We have clear guidance on how AFLP funds can be used. This slide provides some examples of allowable use of funds, as well as a few activities that are not allowed. RFA Part 8B provides additional information on use of funds and RFA Part 9 Contract Budget provides guidance and links to resources for developing Attachment 8, the budget template. As an example of allowable expenses, there's salaries and benefits, meeting expenses, travel for program and training purposes, concrete supports and client support materials, and incentives and rewards for AFLP participants with limitations. Unallowable expenses include purchase or improvement of land, building alterations, renovations, or construction, fundraising. In addition to Title V funding, agencies may elect to contribute local funds for expanding AFLP services. These local funds may be unmatched or may be utilized as a match to draw down Title 19 federal financial participation funding. Identifying local funds unmatched or matched does not influence the selection of agencies for AFLP Title V funding. To facilitate budgeting for Medi-Cal, agencies that intend to use Title 19 funds should identify their local contribution and their total Title 19 request in their proposed budget. For additional information, see Attachment 12 budget template. In the case where an agency is approved for Title 19 matching, the agency's Title 19 invoices would be submitted to MCAH for payment. However, the agency would be responsible for the appropriate use of funds in compliance with Title 19 requirements. Slide, please. Here is a recap of the resources that will support you in responding to the budget and its justification. RFA Part 9 provides guidance on developing your budget. Appendix 3 is a sample budget. RFA Part 5, Section E, describes the budget as it applies to the program narrative. Attachment 3 is the program narrative where you will respond to the budget and provide a description of the expenses. And if your budget proposes Title 19 funds, refer to Appendix 4 for the Medi Cal factors to apply and Additionally, submit attachment 15. Slide, please. Here are a few reminders to keep in mind while developing your budget and justification. The proposed budget should comply with the minimum case manager requirements as outlined in Table 1, anticipated awardee funding levels based on caseload and corresponding case manager full-time equivalency. Unless the applicant proposes to contribute other sources of funds, personnel in the budget should align with the Table 4 minimum staffing pattern. Staff and roles not listed in the budget template and staffing pattern must be agency funded. If the applicant proposes to use any additional funds to support the program, the total budget less other funds should align with Table 1. In the budget template, other cost line includes sublines for optional expenses, advertising, public awareness, and participant educational activities. Now I'll turn it over to my fellow AFLP consultant, Claire Singh. Thank you. At this time, uh, we'll go over um, the application submission process. Right. 
So this slide uh, summarizes the instructions for the application submission. Um, applicants are to develop applications by following all RFA instructions outlined in part four, application submission process. Um, part four, section F, the instructions for preparation and submission of applications includes general instructions, application submission content, submission process, and applicant costs. Application packages must be sent via email to AFLP underscore RFA at cdph.ca.gov no later than 4 p.m. on April 10th. Applicants will receive a confirmation email. Applications received after 4 p.m. on April 10th will be considered late and will not be reviewed or scored. CDPH and CAH is not responsible for failure to submit in a timely manner, so please do not wait until the last minute to submit your application packages because you never know what's going to happen. Also, please note that the maximum file size that we can accept per email is 25 megabytes. So if your application is larger than that, please break it up into multiple emails. Next slide, please. Next, we'll talk about evaluation and selection. During the first stage of review, the application checklist and application package will be reviewed to ensure that applicants meet the RFA eligibility criteria described in part one, um, section I, eligibility criteria, and submitted all required content described in part four, application submission process. During the second stage of review, Evaluation of the application will be based on the quality and appropriateness of the responses and elements in part five of the RFA, uh, the program narrative and corresponding attachments. Scores will be based on the application's adequacy, thoroughness, and the degree to which it complies with the RFA requirements, meet CDPH and CAH's program needs, and demonstrates capacity to implement the PYD model and effectively serve expectant and parenting youth in California. Next slide, please. So this slide uh, provides an overview of the scoring and further detail can be found in part six of the RFA. The total possible score is 114 points with a breakdown as shown on this slide. Agency experience and organizational capacity at 36 points. Need in proposed service area um, at 18 points. Implementation plan, 36 points. Community engagement, referral network, and letters of support, 15 points. And budget proposal, nine points. Next slide, please. In addition to the second stage review, additional reviews may occur to assess the applicant's experience and capacity to perform the required services. This may include reviews of information provided in the agency experience and organizational capacity section of the application, as well as information obtained from other sources. Applications may be evaluated on the verification of references provided and their performance history on other contracts. This review may result in point deductions up to 100% of the total application points. A review will be conducted to evaluate the applicant's financial capability and contract compliance as provided in the agency experience and organizational capacity section of the proposal. CDPH and CAH reserves the right to conduct a review to determine the significance of any litigation or judgments pending against the applicant during the review or after funds are rewarded. 
Next slide, please. We'll now go over award administration. Upon successful completion of the review process, CDPH and MCAH will post a notice of intent to award funds on the AFLP RFA website. Please note that the term of the resulting cooperative agreement is expected to be 36 months and is anticipated to be effective from July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2026, depending on the availability of state and federal funds. The agreement term may change if CDPH and CAH cannot execute the agreement in a timely manner due to unforeseen delays. The resulting agreement will be of no force or effect until signed by both parties and approved by CDPH or the Department of General Services or DGS, whichever is applicable. The applicant is advised not to begin performance until all approvals are obtained. Should performance begin before all approvals are obtained, said services may be considered to have been volunteered. Upon written request to CDPH and CAH, applicants may receive the review rating sheet. Slide, please. This slide provides an overview of the appeal process. Only those applicants who were not selected as an awardee may file an appeal. Appeals are limited to the grounds that CDPH and CAH failed to correctly apply the standards for reviewing applications in accordance with this RFA. Disagreements with the content of the review committee's evaluation are not grounds for an appeal. Applicants may not appeal solely on the basis of the funding amount. Only timely and complete appeals that comply with the process stated herein will be considered. For additional details about the appeal process, please refer to Part 7B, Appeal Process, and Part 1K, the RFA, Key Action Dates in the RFA. Next slide. Finally, so next step. To review, here is the slide that was shown at the beginning of the webinar. All applicants are advised of the following schedule and must adhere to the required dates and times as shown on this slide. CDPH and CAH reserves the right to adjust any date and or time as necessary. Any adjustments will be posted as an addendum on the AFLP RFA website. As a reminder, it is the applicant's responsibility to check the AFLP RFA website frequently for any adjustments made to the timeline. Next slide, please. CDPH and CAH will accept questions and reporting of errors related to the RFA. Questions may include, but are not limited to, the services to be provided for the RFA and or its accompanying materials, instructions, or requirements. All applicants, including any current AFLP awardees, must follow the process as outlined in the RFA to submit a question or report an error in the RFA. Questions must be submitted via email to AFLP underscore RFA at cdph.ca.gov, no later than 4 p.m. on Wednesday, March 8th. Please refer to Part 4B in the RFA for more information on applicant questions and reporting of errors. Next slide, please. Prospective applicants are highly encouraged to voluntarily indicate their intention to submit an application. Failure to submit the letter of intent will not affect the acceptance of any application. This request is made solely to assist CDPH and CAH in planning staffing needs related to the RFA review. The letter of intent is not binding 
and prospective applicants are not required to submit an application merely because a letter of intent is submitted. Please refer to Part 4E in the RFA for more information about the voluntary non-binding letter of intent. Next slide. All documents related to this RFA can be downloaded from the AFLP RFA webpage. It is the applicant's responsibility to visit the AFLP RFA webpage on a frequent basis for current postings and any agenda. I please. On this slide are some references relating to the AFLP PYD model. These references are also included in Appendix 1A, which is the theoretical foundation of the AFLP PYD model. Next slide. These webinar slides will be posted on the AFLP RFA website, as well as a recording. Thank you for attending the AFLP RFA informational webinar.